Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters, I'm Sister B and welcome to Islamic Audio Bites. Let's join islamiclegacy.org and listen to the second part of the Crusades story. The Crusades 2, Mongol Scourge. The overview on the website states, The unanticipated assault of the Mongol Tartars on the Islamic Empire has been and will always be one of the worst and the most bloody of its kind ever to affect the Muslim Ummah in its history. The way Allah spared the religion of Islam through this extremely difficult time is incredible and nothing short of divine. It is truly a time in Islamic history every Muslim should know about and no Muslim should ever forget. Let's listen. Prelude. It has been a long and bloody 57 years since the liberation of Jerusalem and the passing of the great Sultan Salahuddin ibn Ayyub. The fruit of victory that so many Mujahideen gave their lives for has not settled on the land. Bloodshed and intrigue have returned to plague the Muslim Ummah as the family of Ayyub, corrupt and inept, fight amongst themselves for power and property and made alliances with their mortal enemies, the Christian Franks. Once again, the Muslim Ummah falls to its knees due to its own misdeeds. Europe watches the developments with keen interest. Now is the time to plunge a dagger into the heart of the Ummah. Having just enslaved Muslim Spain, King Louis IX and Pope Innocent IV make plans to regain Jerusalem. But first, there is one more obstacle to be removed. The Kingdom of Egypt, the source of Islam's military power, must be vanquished. Louis IX writes a letter to the terminally ill Sultan in Cairo in 1249. It is not hidden from you that we have in our power the Muslim people of the Spanish Peninsula with the wealth and gifts they bring to us. We drive the Muslims like cattle. We kill their men. We make their women widows. We take their girls and boys as captives and we clear the land of them and empty their houses. I have told you and warned you of the armies that have come in my service. They fill the plains and the mountains. They are as numerous as the pebbles, and they are sent to you with the swords of destruction. The Seventh Crusade had begun. The Christians were invading once again. Their fear of the Muslims is but a distant memory. Chapter 1. The Seventh Crusade While the last of the Ayyubid sultans lay dying in his Egyptian palace, racked by fits of coughing, unable to move, unable to take command of his armies, the Muslims of the coastal city of Damietta fled the crusader armies. The crusaders swooped down on the now deserted city of Damietta. It wasn't long before the great mosque was turned into a cathedral and the most fanatical of knights, the Templars, Hospitallers, and Teutons assumed residence in key buildings of the city. In five months, Damietta was transformed into a Christian town and military base, from which the French crusaders would launch their ultimate conquest of Egypt. The Sultan had set out from Cairo with his army to confront the crusaders. He managed to make camp at Al-Mansura, where they were joined by the Egyptian navy. But unfortunately for the Muslims, just as they began to gain ground on the crusaders, the Sultan slipped into a coma and passed away, leaving Egypt leaderless and in a state of chaos. The heir to the throne, Turan Shah, was in Al Jazeera, unable to return to Egypt in time. Buoyed by news of the Sultan's death, the Crusaders gathered their forces for a full-strength assault on Cairo. However, the Egyptian army had regrouped under the leadership of the Mamluk emirs. For three months, 
The army of the Ayyubid sultans fought bravely over land and sea to fend off the crusaders, but the Muslims were once again betrayed by their own. An Egyptian led the French knight Robert of Artois along a secret path hidden beneath shallow waters to the Muslim camp. Ibn Wasil narrates, The Muslims suddenly found that the Franks were in their camp. The emir was washing himself in his bath when he heard a cry go up that the Franks had taken the Muslims by surprise. Frenziedly, he leapt into the saddle without weapons or any means of defending himself, and a band of Franks fell on him and killed him. Allah have mercy on him. He was a worthy emir, learned and cultivated, generous and wise, high-minded and magnanimous, without peer among his brothers or any other The man. Frankish king penetrated Montserrat and reached the Sultan's palace. The Franks spread through the narrow streets of the town, while the civilian and military population scattered in all directions. Islam was about to suffer a mortal blow, and the Franks were now sure of their victory. And then, at this moment of supreme danger to the Ummah of Muhammad, peace be upon him, something extraordinary happened. As the Franks penetrated the narrow streets of Al-Mansurah, pursuing the fleeing Egyptians, spreading fear and terror in the city, they were confronted by the Sultan's elite Mamluk regiments. These soldiers were not fleeing. In fact, they didn't seem to be affected by the general state of panic. The Mamluks had an air of confidence about them. They had taken up positions at strategic points across the city and were waiting patiently for the crusaders to arrive. When the Frankish cavalry poured into the city, the Turkish lions emerged from the side streets. They were few in number, but they fought with courage and a relentless fury. It was a bloodbath. The crusader heavy cavalry could not maneuver in the narrow streets. The Mamluks charged the knights. Robert of Artois barricaded himself in a house with his bodyguards, but the Mamluks hunted him down and slaughtered him and his entourage. Amongst the Templars that entered the city, only five escaped with news of defeat. The remaining crusader army panicked immediately adopting a defensive position behind a trench. But the Mamluk army emerged from Al-Mansura to launch a series of devastating charges on the Crusaders' defensive <laughs> positions. Fierce fighting broke out between the two sides. The Muslim navy captured Crusader ships, cutting Frankish communications with Damietta. Without supplies, the Christian army was vulnerable to famine and disease. The battle turned in favor of the Muslims. The French King Louis offered peace terms to the Muslims, but they refused. Louis ordered a retreat. The Mamluks pursued without hesitation. The Crusaders found themselves surrounded. The Mamluks showed no mercy. 30,000 Franks were slaughtered. The French King Louis IX, along with his Frankish princes, begged for their lives. The royals, along with 10,000 other prisoners, were chained and led away. The king's ransom was set at one million gold coins. Before dying, the Egyptian sultan had responded to the letter of Louis IX. His quote from the Holy Quran must have reverberated in the mind of Louis IX. How often does a small group overcome a mighty host by Allah's permission? And Allah is with the patient ones. Rather than celebrate this historic victory, the heir to the throne of Egypt, Turan Shah, sought to make peace with the French king and rid himself of the powerful Mamluks. But his father's armies would not stand by while the sultan destabilized the Ummah. Within two months, Turan Shah was dead. The slaves of Egypt now became its masters. Chapter 2. The Slave Kings of Egypt Mamluks were the solution to a complex problem that plagued the Muslim nation since the early Abbasid Khilafah. Muslim armies were typically made up of soldiers from diverse backgrounds. A single army may have Turks, Arabs, Kurds, Turkmen, and Berbers fighting alongside each other, and in particular, 
The early Seljuk armies frequently had Armenian Christians, Greeks, and Byzantine soldiers as well. These soldiers were often more loyal to their own tribes or families than the Sultan or even the Khalifa. As a result, the motivations of soldiers could never be entirely trusted, and applying discipline had repercussions if the soldiers were politically or otherwise connected. What the sultans needed was a body of soldiers that was devoted to them and them alone, and were not distracted or compromised by external concerns such as family ties and loyalties. However, there was an even greater problem that the sultans did not immediately recognize. The armies of the Muslim nation were gradually becoming weaker over time. Over the many years since the passing of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Muslim nation allowed her soul to be gradually corrupted by worldly desires. As a result, her soldiers suffered from a lack of motivation, courage, and discipline. The Muslim nation was becoming vulnerable to attack from outside its own boundaries. Most sultans were not really concerned with the defense of Muslim lands. They acted to solve the problem of divided loyalties out of their own self-interest. But in the greater scheme of things, Allah was raising a new breed of soldier that would take on the responsibility to defend Islam and Muslim lands from the 9th century to the 19th century. The words of Ibn Khaldun describe the calamity that befell the Muslim nation and its solution. When the people of the faith sunk in self-indulgence, preoccupied with pleasure and abandoned to luxury, had become deficient in energy and reluctant to rally in defense, and had stripped off the skin of courage and the emblem of manhood, then it was by the grace of Allah, glory be to Him, that He came to rescue the true faith by reviving its last breath and restoring in Egypt the unity of the Muslims, guarding his order and defending his walls. This he did by sending to the Muslims, out of this Turkish people and out of its mighty and numerous tribes, guardian emirs and devoted defenders who are imported as slaves, who were brought from the house of war to the house of Islam under the rule of slavery, which hides in itself a divine blessing. By means of slavery, they learn glory and blessing and are exposed to divine providence. Cured by slavery, they enter the Muslim religion with the firm resolve of true believers and yet with nomadic virtues unsullied by their debased nature, unadulterated with the filth of pleasure, undefiled by the ways of civilized living and with their ardor unbroken by the profusion of luxury. These soldiers were called the Mamluks. The sultans recruited these soldiers as young slaves from the pagan Turkish tribes of Central Asia. They were converted to Islam, trained in military affairs, then freed as professional soldiers. Ibn Khaldun once again describes this curious phenomenon in detail. The slave merchants bring them to Egypt in batches like sand grouse to the watering places, and government buyers have them displayed for inspection and bid for them, raising the price above their value. They do not do this in order to subjugate them, but because it intensifies loyalty, increases power, and is conducive to ardent zeal. They choose from each group according to what they observe of the characteristics of the race and the tribes. Then they place them in government barracks, where they give them good and fair treatment, educate them, have them taught Koran, and kept at religious studies until they have a firm grasp of this. Then they train them in archery, in fencing, in horsemanship, in hippodromes, and in thrusting with the lance and in striking with the sword until their arms grow strong and their skills become firmly rooted. When the masters know that they have reached the point when they are ready to defend them, even to die for them, they double their pay and increase their grants and impose on them the duty to improve themselves in the use of weapons and horsemanship and so also to increase the number of men of their own race in the service for that purpose. Often they use them in the service of the state 
Appoint them to high state offices, and some of them are chosen to sit on the throne of the sultans and direct the affairs of the Muslims, in accordance with divine providence and with the mercy of Allah to his creatures. Thus, one intake comes after another, and generation follows generation, and Islam rejoices in the benefit which it gains through them, and the branches of the kingdom flourish with the freshness of youth. No expense was spared in the religious, military, and literary training of these so-called slaves. Because of the expense involved in recruiting, training, and equipping the sultan's mamluks, they were always going to be few in number. Rarely more than 1,500 strong was assigned to a sultan. During peacetime, they functioned as bodyguards. During wartime, they formed the core of the army. The mamluks were loyal to their master. They had no ties with anyone except that of brotherhood with their fellow Mamluks. Since they were technically slaves, their sons could not inherit their wealth or property, so Mamluk dynasties could not arise and threaten the sultan's power base and the stability of the region. The Mamluk had to master a range of skills such as archery, wrestling, and horse racing, and must be able to use the lance, sword, knife, mace, and other weapons, whether charging on horseback or on foot, whether standing, running, kneeling, or squatting. The Mamluk fought furiously with skill and courage. While the Christian knight still practiced crude techniques, using his sword and lance to hack and thrust, the Mamluk was encouraged to develop more sophisticated ways of fighting. He would prefer to cut and slice with surgical control. Mamluk sultans wrote practical books on military theory and were concerned about political and military strategy. The sultanate had an intelligence organization and practiced secrecy and elaborate ruses. The loyalty and competence of senior emirs and the Mamluk regiments were closely monitored. Training was very rigorous and promotion was strictly on merit. Before the Egyptian Sultan al-Sali succumbed to his terminal illness, he attempted to unify the fragmented Ayyubid state by buying greater numbers of Turkish Mamluks for his Egyptian army. These Mamluks formed the famous Bahriya and Jamdoriya guard. Together they numbered only 1,000, but this potent force brought about a revolution that changed the course of history for Egypt. However, the death of the last Ayyubid sultan, Turan Shah, brought about a conundrum for the Mamluks. Since they were technically slaves, they could not accept the title of sultan at the same time. How could they then form a legitimate government? Ibn Wasil relates the remarkable solution. After the assassination of Turan Shah, the emirs and Mamluks met near the sultan's pavilion and decided that Shajar al-Dur, a wife of Sultan Ayyub, would be placed in power, becoming queen and sultana. She took charge of the affairs of state, establishing a royal seal in her name inscribed with the formula Umm Khalil, a child of hers who had died at an early age. In all the mosques, the Friday sermon was delivered in the name of Umm Khalil, Sultana of Cairo and all of Egypt. This was unprecedented in the history of Islam. Shortly after she was placed on the throne, the Sultana married one of the Mamluk chiefs and conferred the title of Sultan upon him. The new Mamluk Sultanate dispensed with the conciliatory attitude toward the Franks. The Mamluk saw themselves as superior to the Westerners in culture, law, religion, and human relations. They enforced strict legal and moral discipline in the realm. Alcoholic beverages and drugs like hashish were banned. Prostitution was forbidden. Sound religious scholarship was upheld, and the sharia was strictly enforced. The Mamluk sultans aspired to be model Islamic leaders. Their first task was to confront an evil plague that had unleashed its bloodlust on the Muslim Ummah, leaving a trail of death and destruction the likes of which cannot be described. This was the Mongol horde whose thundering hooves and piercing arrows had brought the Ummah to the verge of extinction. Fortunately for the Muslim Ummah, they arrived at just the right time. 
Chapter 3 Evil Stirs in the Steps Thousands of miles to the east of Arabia and just above China lay the Mongolian steppes. This vast piece of land had been isolated from the rest of the world from the earliest of times by a series of formidable natural barriers. To the west of this region were two enormous mountain ranges converging on each other. To the south, the vast and dry Gobi Desert. And to the north, the frigid cold of the Siberian tundra. In spring, the steppes were covered with an immense green carpet with flowers blossoming across the plains. But in summer, fire-breathing winds would sweep north from the Gobi Desert, turning the spring plains to arid desert. In winter, the mountains turned white with snow, the rivers and streams froze. Throughout the year, violent gales would tear across the steppes, creating mind-numbing blizzards and scorching desert storms. Temperatures on this land were extreme, 38 degrees in summer and minus 42 degrees in winter. Neither animal nor insect can be expected to survive in such extreme conditions, and yet this land had been inhabited for as long as history can record. Upon the immense expanse of these plains, there are no cities, no villages, no boundaries. The Mongols spent their lives wandering on these plains, living in tents and breeding sheep, goats, horses, and camels. Their livestock sustained them, They slaughtered them for food, used their skins to make clothes, tents, and whatever else they needed, and drank their milk. At the end of autumn, they would slaughter their animals and freeze the meat to sustain them through the winter. The nomads were constantly on the move, migrating on horseback several times a year from one mountain pasture to another. It is said that Mongol children learned to ride before they could crawl. For the Mongols that lived in forests, the principal source of pleasure was hunting. Armed with bows and arrows or lassoes, they tracked down antelopes and boars through forest land. At times, these hunting expeditions turned into large-scale events that involved strategizing and military maneuvers as if it were a full-scale war. The absence of public rituals of worship gave travelers the impression that the Mongols had no religion. However, the Mongols did believe in a god they named Tengri, or Eternal Heaven. They maintained customs from their old animist days, such as worshipping fire and climbing to the top of sacred mountains to approach their god and call upon him. They also believed that river springs were sacred, and therefore the water must not be contaminated by filth. Therefore washing the body, clothes, or even cooking utensils was strictly forbidden. As a result, the Mongols lived a life devoid of hygiene. Of all the characteristics of the Mongols, it was their cruelty, immorality, and debauchery that was most shocking. The Mongols inclined to remain drunk frequently and for as long as possible. Their intertribal warfare frequently resulted in the most savage punishment, such as massacring the entire male populations of tribes boiling the prisoners of war in a large iron cauldron, and sometimes even eating their flesh. Equally disturbing was their belief that the frequent abduction of women, including their own wives, for the carnal pleasure of others, were deeds of manliness and excellence. Killing the innocent, invading countries, and seizing others' property were not sins in the least. The Mongol lifestyle espoused values and beliefs that were the very opposite of Islam. The Mongols ate pretty much anything, lice, rats, cats, dogs, even human blood. They did not know marriage. Several men would go with one woman. If a child was born, it would not know its father. The Mongols adored idols in the shape of human figures. They would place these on decorated carts on either side of the entrance to their tents. Anybody who stole from the cart would be put to death without hesitation. The Mongols would sacrifice the first milk of their cattle and the first morsels of food to the idols before they began to eat themselves.
However much the Mongols continued to struggle amongst themselves, they remained contained within the natural geographic boundaries of the mountains to the west, the deserts to the south, and the frozen plains to the north. The world remained largely oblivious to their existence. The year 1162 CE marked the birth of a boy named Temujin to the chieftain of a small clan. Temujin was cast out of his clan with his mother and siblings after his father was poisoned by a local rival. The family was forced to forage for their own food, eating wild plants, small animals, and even mice. But unlike most young Mongol boys, Temujin demonstrated ingenuity in solving problems, courage in taking on the enemy, and perseverance in pursuing his aims. After a period of 25 years, in 1206, Temujin, now a ruthless yet ingenious conqueror, managed to unite the tribes of the Mongols and the Tartars under him. He became the Grand Chief, or Genghis Khan. The large numbers of Mongol tribes, combined with their military skill and Spartan upbringing, made them the most potent military force of their time. Whether it was the deserts of Syria, the mountains of Afghanistan, the snowy plains of Russia, or the jungles of Vietnam, neither climate nor terrain could impede them in their conquest for world domination. Genghis Khan unleashed the Mongol horde on the world. His aim? to force all of mankind to submit themselves to the will of the Great Khan. That is it for the Crusades Part 2, Mongol Scourge. I hope you are finding our podcast of benefit. Can I please ask that you leave a review and rating wherever you listen and share the podcast with your family and friends. We are on all the major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and we're also on YouTube as a voice-only channel. Do join our Islamic Audio Bytes community on Facebook and Instagram and follow me on Twitter. We also have a website at islamicaudiobytes.com if you could check that out as well. Any feedback or if you'd like to contact me directly, please do at sisterb007 at gmail.com. Otherwise, please keep us in your du'as. Hope your day is full of goodness. Assalamu alaikum.